Good morning. <laughs> yeah. Will you all stand up? Let's worship God together.
to be emptied again the seed i've received i will sow amen well good morning on this very tired weather day that's just how it makes me feel um normally i share something really really like chipper and cheerful, but today it's actually something that terrified me a little bit this week. Um, it was this, uh, you are the only Bible some believers will ever read, or some unbelievers will ever read. You are the only Bible some unbelievers will ever read. And that honestly terrifies me when I think about myself. And I think, wow, that's, that's a bit impossible. And that feels really heavy. And that reminds me of the conversation that um, Jeremiah had with God and where God says to Jeremiah I'm the Lord the God of all peoples of the world is anything too hard for me like okay so you you've got this obviously it's not me it's you I know this but what do I do how can I possibly bear that um in Matthew 22 37 through 39 um the religious leaders had just asked Jesus what's the most important thing and he says you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is so much easier said than done. It is so hard to love people we like and people we don't like. But with love, just remember, just show up. Sometimes that's all we've got to do. Just show up. Just be there for them. And whether it's easy, whether it's difficult, whether it's good or not so good, what's going on, being there for one another, praying for one another, that's how we can be the Bible to others.
to gather with these people to just praise you. God, to sing to you, to worship you, to honor you. God, you're so good, and we just thank you for who you are and for your goodness, God, for bringing us here safely, Lord, so that we could worship together um, in a place where we are free to do that. And God, there are so many places all over the world who, who can't, who are condemned, who are murdered for claiming you as as God and as their Savior. So thank you for the freedom to just gather together to worship you. And I pray that what you hear, God, with, with our voices and the instruments, God, that you are pleased, Lord. I pray that we all just lift our voices to you, no matter if we feel like we can sing or not, God. You just want us to make a joyful noise. So I pray that we all just do that and worship you however we we feel and however we choose, God. So take all of this um, and just know that we love you and we are here for you this morning, God. Be with us as we continue to worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Try to stop your love and you to take the very thing you gave your life for and you would come running and tear down every wall all the while you're shouting my love you're worth it all this God you pursue you 
Amen. Will you pray with me, church? Father, we thank you for that promise, for that declaration. God, that nothing can separate us from your love. For those of us who love you, those that you call your children, God, you, you pull us in. God, even as we, as we drift, God, you pull us back. And we are reminded that we are yours and you are ours. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, you can have a seat. Good morning, Rich Church. How are we doing? Good. All right. Well, hey, we're so glad you're here uh, together with us this morning. If you're watching on Facebook, thanks for tuning in with us again. Uh, we had a little technical difficulty this morning uh, with some things, but hey, it's all good. We're back. We're back. So we get to, to do that. And uh, so we're glad that you guys are here. We're glad that you guys are watching online well and uh, for all of us if listen if today is your first day here with us at Ridge Church or whether you're connecting with us online for the first time uh, we'd love for you to do something really simple is you see it on the screen back here behind me is just grab your phone and text the word hello to the number there that you see on the screen 865-276-8107 uh, we'd love to uh, just send you a text message back you just click that link follow the instructions there take you about 30 seconds so it's just an easy way for us to get to know you, you get to know us, and uh, you can ask any questions or let us know about prayer requests or any of those things. And for all of us in the room, you can use that number to send us a text and just be like, hey, just pray for me about this, or I've got a question about this, or I'd love to start serving in this way. That is an easy way for you to be able to do that, super easy, convenient. Uh, and then there are two other ways that you can do that. If you don't want to do the text message thing, uh, just go to richchurch.info. That's our online connect card. It's the same thing. Or... On the way out, grab a card outside at the table. You pass it on the way in here. It's called Ridge Central, and you can do the old school thing and you know fill one out with the pen that works. Hopefully, that would be a good idea. Uh, but anyway, we're so glad that you're here uh, together with us. Hey, tonight, uh, it's a, an exciting day here at Ridge Church. Tonight, we have our Five Alive Worship Night, and so we're going to gather back together here this evening at 5 o'clock. We've got child care from babies up to... Kindergarten, and so if you have kids that that want to be a part of that, they can be a part of that down there, and they're going to have a great time down there. They're not just going to be uh, hanging out doing nothing. We've got some stuff planned for them, so it's going to be a lot of fun for them. But up here, and your older kids as well, like we want to come in here and worship together, just like we did this morning. Uh, it's going to be a little different. It's going to be a lot louder. We're going to have a lot of fun, and it's going to be a great. We've got a great guest here with us, uh, Adam Barnes. Adam's actually over there, right? I see Adam back there in the back, back there. Adam's like, don't point to me. Uh, but uh, you're going to be up here with a microphone, sir, in a couple of hours. So uh, Adam is going to come and share with us. Adam is one of our pastors in the Ignite Church Network, uh, church planting network that we have right here in our area that helps plant churches all over the world. And uh, Adam is going to be uh, sharing with us uh, for a few minutes tonight as well. So I hope that you'll be back for that tonight. It's at five o'clock right here. Uh, at the Ridge Church. So let me pray for us, and we will hop into today's message here in just a moment. Father, we thank you for, um, God, just allowing us to gather here. God, we pray that we've honored you in our worship towards you. Uh, God, we pray that you just open our hearts. God, you open our minds and our ears and our eyes. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Father, what you would have to say to us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Me again. <laughs> always, always weird doing the announcements and then coming back and just be like, hey, I'm Bobby. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, but that's all good. Hey, if you have a Bible with you, open it up to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, if you brought one with you, that's cool. You can uh, go there. We'll have it on the screen behind me. If you have Bible, we have uh, the U Bible app. You can grab that, uh, click on more, and then events, and you can get all of today's notes and scripture right there. And there's always uh, some extra goodies in there as well. Uh, there's a link to a, a devotional that you can later this week if you choose to do so. But we've been in this series on the Sermon on the Mount for the last couple of weeks, and uh, we're going to continue that today. We're going to finish up Matthew chapter 5 today, but the Sermon on the Mount, those uh, sermons where uh, 
this for as far as we can tell it's his longest message that he gave at least recorded that he gave uh, probably took him about 10 or 15 minutes uh, just to to go through the things that was saying, which, you know, we're going to spend eight weeks on it, so, you know, there's that, right? But we ha- probably don't understand things the way that uh, th- these first century Jewish people would have understood them when Jesus said them. We have to do a little work and unpack a few things. And so when Jesus starts the Sermon on the Mount, he starts with the Beatitudes. Now, we're probably all familiar with the Beatitudes, even if you've not been in church very long, you've heard these before, right? Where Jesus says things like this, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom, or for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, right? And so there's about that and Jesus starts this sermon off this way and it's really important because not only is it foundational to us it would have been foundational to those listening to it especially for his disciples who he just called to begin to follow him and walk with them so he's teaching them and showing them he's saying this this is my character and nature but this is the way that we should live and so that word blessed even, like we, we forget that the word blessed has a, a special meaning to it that we kind of have lost over the, the many years since the first century, obviously, that we might not understand the way that they would have understood. And so when Jesus said blessed are the poor in spirit, that word blessed actually means happy. Happy to be. Happy are, right? And so when he says blessed, he would say this. He would say happy are those who are poor in spirit, meaning that those who feel spiritually bankrupt knowing that the only way that they can get through this life is by leaning on a Savior, right? And then when Jesus says, happy are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And he goes on and on and on, and you got eight of these, but when he gets to the last one, he says this, he says, you are blessed when they insult you and persecute you. So again, put that into our understanding. He says that, You are happy when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you. And he says, but it's because of me. And so, like, we have to understand that, like, in a a different context, right? But it's really important. So Jesus, is all he's saying is this. He's saying, this is the way of a disciple. This is the way of one of my followers, is that we should live to the best of our flawed ability in this way. And then he goes on, and as he, as he continues on, he, he gets into these things where he's going to say a couple of things that are really, really hard for us to get our hands around unless we do a little work around it. Like, for example, as he continues on in his sermon, he says this in verse 20, Matthew 5, verse 20. He says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. And now you might be thinking, Jesus, that's a little harsh, right? That's a, that's a little hard there, right? Like never get into the kingdom of heaven? Like our righteousness has to surpass that of the Pharisees and the scribes? And again, Pharisees and scribes, these were the religious leaders of the day. They would have been very, uh, Testament, especially for a Pharisee, like they knew first five books of the Bible, like without even thinking about it. They could just say it, they could recite the whole thing without even saying it in their sleep. Right, and we think we know the Bible well sometimes, right? Or maybe we think, well, I don't even know it well at all. Like these guys, like, whoo, you know? And so Jesus says this, he says, your righteousness, if you want to get into the kingdom of heaven, your righteousness must exceed theirs. It must surpass theirs. And so is Jesus basically saying it is impossible to do that? He's actually kind of being a little funny. Because if you understand anything about the Pharisees and the scribes, is, is they didn't have any righteousness at all. Their righteousness was kind of a false righteousness because later on, Jesus will say things like this directly to their face. He will say things to them like, hey, you know what? You talk a good game, but your walk is pretty horrible. He says, you you honor me with your lips. Like you say all of the right things, but your heart actually is far from me. And then he says things like this. He says, woe to you. And basically he's like, you better step back. That's what woe to you means. He's like, woe to you. Pharisees, he says, you're, you're, the plate on the outside is clean, but it's you're all dirty on the inside. It's like, so you, you talk a good talk, but the game is horrible. 
And so when Jesus says that our righteousness must surpass theirs, Jesus is actually, you know, believe it or not, maybe we don't think this about Jesus sometimes, he's actually kind of making a joke. You know, like everybody would have heard that and they would have laughed. It would have been one of those moments, right? Where everybody laughs when Jesus says something like that. Like it's kind of a little tongue in cheek. But what Jesus does over the next few verses and as he continues on in the sermon is he deconstructs the way of the Pharisees. Pharisee lives and this is the way that a Pharisee is and so what he does next is he after he deconstructs that he begins to reconstruct it in an even more impossible way and so six different times he brings it to a place of what he says he says we we and he doesn't say it in these exact words but he says you and I we have to move out of like behavior modification and we have to understand that what we're talking about here is actually heart transformation. This is not just simply modifying our behavior. Like, there has to be a chain of heart that takes place here. And so what he does, Jesus is really good at this. He kind of deconstructs and then reconstructs. And a couple of times here, he says things like this. In like verse 21, he says, You've heard it said to our ancestors, do not murder. Everybody listening would have heard that. Like, you and I know that, right? Like, even from, like, little kids, like, we're like, hey, don't kill people. It's bad, right? Don't do that. They would have heard it, and they would have immediately thought about Moses and the Ten Commandments, right? Because the Ten Commandments say what? Do not kill, right? Do not murder, right? And Jesus said, you have heard it said, do not murder. And everybody would be like, yeah, 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 we've heard that. And then, but then he does this. He says, but I tell you, so there's, here comes the, the deconstruction and reconstruction. He says, but I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And so Jesus just took it to a whole other level. He's like, you've heard it said, just don't kill anybody. I'm telling you, don't be angry because that's just as bad. In your heart. Again, he's talking about heart transformation. But he goes on and he talks about things like adultery. He talks about things like divorce. He talks about an oath. And then we get down here to the very end, which I honestly think is really one of the hardest things for us to get. And he says this. Let me read it to you. Verse 8. He says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. As for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. To the one who asks you, don't, 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 what is that? Is that a word? Don't, hey, don't turn a what? Never mind, all right. Appalachian American, right here. Don't enunciate. Don't, right? I don't even know where I'm at. He says, give to the one who asks. And don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. He goes on. This next one flows into this. They go together. He says, on one hand, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You've heard that. I say turn the other cheek. And he goes on. He says, you have also heard that it was said, love your neighbor. And hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing? doing out of the ordinary don't even the gentiles do the same and then he says this he says be perfect therefore as your heavenly father is perfect now there are a couple of things to understand here that if we don't understand these couple of things none of this really makes as much sense as what it would have made to them first of all when jesus says an eye for an eye tooth for a tooth that comes from leviticus 24 uh, that's the part of the sort of the mosaic where Moses has given the law to the nation of Israel, where it basically says this, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, means if I hit you, you get to hit me back. Like, whatever I do to you, you can do it back to me, and it's called just, right? So if, if I do something to you and you do it back to me, then 
that's that's justified right and and we've all kind of heard that right like even growing up maybe some of us were told that like in school like hey if you get hit they hit you hit them back right like maybe we've heard that maybe we live by that i don't know but like that's kind of one of those things where does that come from it comes right out of the scriptures now growing up i i would just call this a typical saturday you know it's like, if my brother did something to me, I just did it back to him. But the problem was always this. Where is the end, right? If, 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 if my brother did something to me, I had two brothers growing up, and so, like I said, it was just like a typical Saturday of these, these things happening, right? If I do something to him and he does it back to me, well, you know what? Now I've got to do it back to him because I can't let him do that to me. You know, and so it's just back and forth, back and forth. And so the problem with with this kind of thinking is, is where is the end of this? To what end is there? And so Jesus responds with a solution. And to be honest, it doesn't sound like the right one for many of us, right? Jesus says, that's what you've heard, but I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek. Now, we have to understand what Jesus is saying here, too. And so a question may come up. Is, is Jesus saying that if someone breaks my house to harm my family, I, you know, I just have to turn away from him and just be like, all right, hey, y'all, do what you want. Like, go ahead. Like, take everything in here. Harm me, you know, harm my family. Do what you want. Like, Jesus said I need to turn the other cheek. That is not what Jesus is saying. In fact, we know that Jesus is not saying that because other instances in the Scripture, and again, you have to take all of Scripture together. You can't just take bits and pieces of it. You have to look at it as a whole. But for example, and again, go look this up for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Go look yourself. Luke 22, 36, as, as Jesus is literally about to go to the cross and he's kind of telling his disciples what they're going to go and do, he tells them, he says, if you don't have a sword, take money and buy you one. He's telling them, like, you can protect yourself. And we know that Peter was packing, right? (laughs) Right? Yeah. And so, like, Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying, like, you, you you can protect yourself. And there are at least three or four other examples in the New Testament where we see that. As, as well, Jesus, this is not Jesus advocating that there should be, like, you know, no police or military to combat evil and injustice in the world. In Luke 3, Jesus talks about this, and Paul talks about it in Romans 13. Peter talks about it in 1 Peter chapter 2. And so, is Jesus against unprovoked violence? Yes. Is he against in- Yes. And so with all scripture, again, Jesus' teaching has to be applied with wisdom in the light of related scriptures that address similar situations. So we can't, uh, this is just kind of a side note here, but we can't really just take that and just be, be like, well, you know, we're just supposed to turn the other cheek and just, you know, take what we get. That's not what he's saying at all. And again, you have to understand the context of what he's saying because the other thing to keep in mind here is the slap on the cheek that Jesus is talking about is understood more as an insult, not like a punch to the face. And so they would have understood in the first century, these Jewish people listening to Jesus' sermon, they would have understood that a slap on the cheek is more like, you know, I two dukes in the 1700s like taking their gloves off and slapping each other you know like public insult kind of thing you know what i'm talking about am i the only one that knows what i'm talking about here okay so like like that's the way that they would have understood that and jesus what jesus is telling them is like like that like that's like just let that go uh, l- let's bring it to 2021. If Jesus would have said it like this, he might say, I say to you, when someone posts something about you on Facebook, let it go. <laughs> when someone sends you a mean email, you don't have to respond. I got one of those this week. We don't get a lot of those. 12 years of, of, of this church we've gotten a handful of them. When I retire one day, I will probably read all of those to you. But until then, um, 
Anyway, long story short, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say this. As confession in front of you as a church, I did not respond well, okay? I didn't take it well. I didn't respond well. I wasn't mean about it, but I responded with some snarky comment, right? And it, wasn't, it probably wasn't very nice. And so, hey, if you're watching and you sent that email, uh, I'm sorry. Um, no, really, truly, uh, as going through this, this message this week, like, just kind of reminded me of the fact, like, this is what Jesus said. Like, like I, did not, I did not live and reflect the way that Jesus has called me to live in that way. But this is what Jesus says, Right? And so again, we have to understand this in, in context, but, but let's pick it up a little bit. These two statements that Jesus makes, they, they flow into one another. He says, turn the other cheek, but he also says, he says, love your neighbor. He says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Now, again, something that we have to understand here that, that what Jesus is, is talking about it sounds, remember what he said, he said, your righteousness must surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes. It almost sounds impossible to do the things that Jesus is telling us to do, right? And I would say it is impossible without the power of the Spirit of God. It is impossible. So, three questions that I just want us to, to quickly give an answer to that will help us not only apply this and live it out through the power of the Spirit of God in our lives, but just give us a good understanding of exactly what Jesus is talking about here. Three questions, really quickly. Number one, who are our enemies? Number two, why should we love our enemies? And then number three, how do we actually love our enemies? We actually do it. So let's just start with the first one. Who are our enemies? Now, here, here's the thing about that. We can't let the answer to this be something that's just merely ideological, like, you know, off in the distance somewhere and just kind of be an idea of who our enemies are. Because if I were to ask you in here, like, I don't think anybody in here, if I said, hey, who are your enemies? I don't think anybody in here would say, well, let me tell you about my sworn enemy, you know, Bill next door, right? Like, I, I don't think that that would necessarily be the case, like for most of us. Some of you, I don't know, maybe they cut your hedges down, I, you know, whatever. But, you know, maybe it's the gophers that keep getting in the garden. I can understand that, right? Like, we, you know, maybe that's a sworn enemy. But, like, if I were to say, like, most of us would say, I don't know that I really have an enemy. I don't really know that I have an enemy. So let's, let's kind of back up a little bit. Maybe you don't have, like, an enemy, per se. But I bet you have people that you don't like. But there are people in your life and around your circle that you don't like. And I bet maybe some of those people have maybe done a great injustice to you. Maybe they've hurt you deeply in some ways, mentally, emotionally, physically. Or, or maybe they've caused you a great deal of stress in your life. Or, or you know what, or, or, or maybe it's not that, that they've done that to you, but, but maybe you know of people and you can't figure it out, but they just don't like you. Maybe they've even said that they hate you. Right? This in 2021, this would be considered our enemy. Jesus is talking about people that, that don't like us and people that we don't like ourselves. But what Jesus says is so like counter cultural, uh, cultural to, to our current culture. Jesus says, You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Like for a, a lot of us, we go, Yeah. Right. If they don't like me, I don't like them. If they hurt me, I don't want anything to do with them. But what Jesus actually says is he says, no, I actually want you to love them and do good to them and pray for them. Now can we talk about what sounds impossible? <laughs> he says, love them, pray for them, and do good to them. And so maybe you might even might be like, yeah, but I mean, that's not what Jesus actually really meant. It actually is what Jesus really meant. 
But we have to understand, like, we can't just stop there. We have to understand the why behind it. Why would Jesus say this? Why would he tell us to be this way? Why would he tell you and I to love our enemies, those that have done bad to you, those who have hurt you, those who have done a, an injustice towards you? Why would Jesus tell you and I to love them and to pray for them and to do good for them? And so, number two, why? Why love our enemies? And the answer is going to well, the answer is right in front of us and the answer is simply because this is how God has loved us. He has loved you and I in this way. You you are loved and you are received just as you are. But not only that, it shows what we believe about the Father. Like if we love others this way, the way that Jesus tells us to love our enemies, those who hurt us, those who don't, or those who do bad against us, or that don't like us, it shows what we actually believe about the Father. And so take these couple of things, for example, being loved, right? Enemy love is the gospel, It literally is the gospel. Paul says this, in fact, Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. This is what Paul says. He says, once, once you were alienated and hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions. And so what Paul says is he's saying, especially listening here to all of us who may be believers, he says, don't forget this. Like you weren't born a Christian. There was a point in time before Jesus called you and saved you and redeemed you that you were hostile in your mind toward Jesus toward the gospel he says that's who we once were but he says this he says but now he is reconciled meaning that he has brought back what has been broken and fractured and brought back together to make whole reconciled you by his physical body Jesus through his death to present you holy faultless and blameless before him who is him that is God but he doesn't stop Paul says this in Romans chapter 5 if that didn't quite hit home let this hit home he says but God proves his love his own love he says for us in that while we were still sinners Christ died for us that's the message we're done amen let's go home Right, he, 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 says, he, says, he says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So how much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, we will be saved through him from wrath. Now, come on, church, I've got to talk about this for a second because we forget this sometimes, is that before Jesus saved you, the wrath of God was squarely aimed at you. Until Jesus stepped between the wrath of God and us to save us and be what the Bible says, what Paul says, is a propitiation for our sins. It's a payment. It's a covering. It's a filter, if you will. And he says, for if while we were enemies, there's that word. He says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through his death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? Let me give you one more. First John chapter 4. John says this. He says, love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Listen, you and I did not love God first. He loved us first. He says, dear friends, if God loved us in this way, John brings it home. He's just echoing what Jesus has said here in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, if God loved us in this way, we must also love one another. And there is no, like, asterisk beside the another. (laughs) We must also love those people that we like. We must also love those people that are like us. We must also love those people that get along with us. We must also love those people who have never done anything wrong to us. It's not what it says. There is no asterisk beside the another. And so loving our enemies is to treat others the way that God the Father has treated us. 
We love because we ourselves have been accepted as we are. Again, uh, enemies, sinners, alienated. While we were still sinners, Jesus says it's easy to love people you like, those that are all put together and friendly, right? That's what he says here. He says, he's basically saying, how easy would it be? He says, if you, if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? He's like, that's easy. It's easy to love people that love you. It's easy to like people that like you. It's easy, like it's easy to get along with those people. He's like, even the tax collectors do that. They all hated each other, it seemed like, right? Because they were all trying to get everybody's money. It's like, no, 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 I, that, that man's money is mine. Then he goes on and he says, he says this, he says, treat only your brothers and sisters. What are you do, doing out of the ordinary? He's like, that's normal. Like, everybody does that. So we love because it shows what we ourselves believe about God. Think about that. Like, if we believe that this is the way that Jesus has received us, then we reflect that to others in the way that we love others, and especially our enemies. John Piper, in one of his sermons, he says this. He says, now someone might take the thing that Jesus says so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Someone might take that, he says, to mean that you must first become a person who loves their enemies before you can be a child of God. He's like, you might think that. He says, but... Actually, he says, love your enemies and so prove yourself to be what you are, a child of God. That is, show you are a child of God by acting the way your father acts. If you are his, then his character is in you and you will be inclined to do what he does. God loves his enemies, the evil and the unrighteous and sending rain and sunshine on them instead of instant judgment. And then, just to add a little something to that, because I just love this next quote, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he says this, he says, he says, Christian love draws no distinction between one enemy and another, except that the more bitter our enemy's hatred, the greater his need of love. Be his enmity, political, or religious, he has nothing to expect. Listen to this, church. He says, nothing to expect from a follower of Jesus but unqualified love. In such love, there is not inner discord between the private person and the official capacity. In both, we are disciples of Christ. Listen to what he says. Or not Christians at all. Now, what you need to understand about Bonhoeffer is this is that he was a pastor, writer, theologian in the 1930s and 40s, born before that, but he lived through World War I. He is German, was German. Lived in Germany through World War I, came to America to preach and teach for a while. Uh, and then in 1939, uh, when World War II began and the rise of Nazi Germany began to start to put uh, the Jews in concentration camps, Instead of staying in America where he could have stayed nice, safe, neat, and clean, and all that stuff, Bonhoeffer decided to go back to Germany because he said that he needed to be with his people, to be there for them, to reflect the character and nature of God to them during this difficult time. During that process, an interesting thing happened is that he actually became a spy and helped the United States uh, be able to get to Adolf Hitler later in the war. But before that could ever happen, Bonhoeffer was put into a Jewish concentration camp and killed in that concentration camp. And yet, these are the words that he wrote. See, when we love our enemies, we reflect God. As his image bearers, we show what he is like. When we put his character on display, we show that we're his children. So that's the why. We know the who, we know the why, so how do we do it? What does it look like? Well, Jesus, again, he tells us how. He says, says, love them, right? He says, love your enemies. By the way, that that word love is an action word. There is action. It's not just warm, fuzzy thoughts, right? I'm sending you warm, fuzzy thoughts, right? Like we're not, that's not it. It's actionable. There's something actionable that is taking place there. 
He says, love them, do good to them, and probably the hardest part, he says, pray for them. Pray for them. And I say prayer is hardest because I, I read this once. I'm not sure who actually said this, but um, I just thought it was pretty profound. But they said this. They said, prayer for your enemies is one of the deepest forms of love because it means that you have to really want that something good to happen to them. I want you to, again, go back. Remember when we were asking like those people that you know that might be your enemies? How hard is it to pray for them? I was having a conversation with somebody after the first service and they said, you know, about a year ago I felt the Lord telling me that I needed to pray for my ex-husband and they had done all kinds of horrible things. And I didn't want to, but I started to. And she said this, she said, you know, what I found out is not only does prayer change others, but most importantly, it changes us. And so yesterday, um, my uh, basketball team that I coach along with my um we were playing in a tournament last night basketball tournament and uh, i made a really bad coaching decision at the end of the game uh, cost our team the game um and when i did uh you know um a lot of details around it i didn't do anything bad i just made a bad decision a coaching decision anyway regardless it doesn't matter the opposing coach's assistant coach he wasn't even coach he was assistant coach was all the way down on his bench we're down on my bench you know just like this whole thing it just happened and I was just like oh you know unbelievable and uh he gets up walks all the way from his bench to our bench walks over to me and starts to shake my hand like oh man that was so awesome you're the real MVP yeah I mean he's just like giving it to me like walked all the way over you know and I'm thinking to myself you're bigger than me but I'm wiry I'm gonna hurt you like, that's what I'm thinking in my mind, right? But I'm honestly, I'm trying to be nice about it. I'm trying to be, like, I'm trying to be Christ-like, you know, and all that. Like, I'm just trying to, like, turn the other cheek, you know. I'm just like, ah, you know, finally I had enough. And I was like, man, get out of here, you know, just the whole thing. Anyway, doesn't matter. So this morning, I'm going through my notes and reading the scriptures. And I, Jesus says, pray for your enemies. And I go, no. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't like this guy. I don't like him at all. And so I decided to pray for him. And I prayed, Father, let him lose every single game that he... <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I wanted to pray that. But I didn't. But I read this quote, you know, because it means that you have to really want that something good happen to them. I don't know the guy. I don't know anything about him. I've coached against him a few times, and I'll be honest, like, I just don't like him. I just don't. Not because of that. Like, I didn't like him before that. But Jesus tells me I got to pray for him. Jesus tells me I got to love him. Jesus tells me I got to want good for him. And so... I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to struggle with that. I'm going to give it my best shot. And not out of my own strength and power, but just relying on the, on the Spirit of God to be able to do that. And so, again, I, you know, I don't know if that's what it practically looks like for you, but what does it practically look like? How we just bring it down on the ground, put some skin around it, and, and give us a really good picture of this? And I don't know that I can necessarily do that, but I want to show you a video. It's a little long. It's about 11 minutes long, but we'll close, uh, we'll close as soon as the video is over. But it's really great. It's by uh, a man by the name of Bob Goff. Uh, some of you might know of Bob. He wrote uh, Love Does and Everybody Is and just had a, another book come out. But uh, Bob is one of the most amazing men that I've ever had an opportunity to uh, encounter. I, I don't personally know him, but I want him to be my grandfather. You'll see why uh, after, you, after you watch this. Uh, he's just an amazing man of God, and like, I, I just learned so much from, from him, uh, like reading his books and seeing different things, and you'll see why in this video. But what does this look like? What does it look like to love your enemies? How do you put skin around that? Like, what does that look like? Take a look at this. I think you'll get a good picture of it. I am joined today by Bob Goff, lawyer, author, and founder of a nonprofit organization that helps children in conflict areas. 
But most interestingly, at least in my mind, he operates a school for witch doctors in Uganda. Bob Goff, thank you so much for joining us. Isn't that crazy? Okay, I, I know witch doctors are a thing because of my travels around the world, but I think a lot of people here in North America are like, they, ex they don't really exist. Yeah, you'd think that would be from hundreds of years ago and you have these images in your mind, but actually uh, witch doctors in many, many countries exist. It, what, the reason that we engage this is that they were actually sacrificing children. Mm -hmm. uh, and But nobody in the country had taken on a witch doctor because they're afraid of them. Yeah. But we're not afraid of these guys, they're punks. Like Jesus has all the power from everything I've been reading. And so the problem is they're always a victim, but the other victims always dies. Um, but there was an attack on a little boy, and we'll just say his name is Charlie, and uh, by the head of all the witch doctors, and his name was Kabi. And, and so, yeah, they, they would take their head, right? Yeah. They would take their head, their private parts, and what yeah. was the other thing? Isn't that crazy? Their blood, their, their head, blood, their private yeah. yeah, had powers. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So this little boy, Charlie, was attacked he, by Kabi. Yes, and they cut off these private parts. They left him for dead, but the, guy, the little kid didn't die. Wow. And so for the first time, we had the head of the witch doctors, we had a little boy that survived. So I asked the Chief Justice of their Supreme Court if I could try their first death penalty case against this witch doctor. And the Supreme Court Justice said, there's no way you're going to ever get a judge to take that because they're so afraid. But then we did. And we tried the case, and the word of this conviction goes out to 41 million people. So you found a judge that would do it. This scrappy, courageous judge. The crazy part, he let us film the whole trial. Wow. It was a crazy, you, crazy. You know, I, I got a comment on this witch doctor thing, because I, I have a friend, he's a missionary in Haiti, and so he deals with voodoo priests, very similar idea. People are terrified of them, and he tells stories all the time of people who get cursed, and they're healthy in the morning, and they're dead by the end of the day, but he tells me, I'm not afraid, because a curse cannot land on a genuine follower of Jesus. And he, they'll leave things on his porch, and he walks out in the morning, kicks it out of the way, and keeps going on with his day, and nothing ever happens to him. Yeah. So faith, do you think, is that a particular protection? Because these are dark powers. Yeah, I just I just think Jesus, from what I'm reading, he has all the powers and there's nothing left to divide up amongst anybody else. <laughs> so divide zero by whatever number you can think still of zero. and you're still zero. So um, so the whole idea isn't just engage it. Don't get freaked out about like witch doctors and all that. Just think of people that are insecure like you and I and that are working that out in different ways. And they, they may have other people in the room <laughs> while they're doing it. But that whole idea to just not be afraid, that was the message all the way through scriptures. Wow. Be not afraid. So you did this bold thing and yeah. you actually won your case and he was sentenced to death. Yeah, so Kabi goes uh, away to this uh, dark prison. Uh, but uh, the little boy, this attack happens with a machete, so he was pretty messed up. Mm. Um, but a uh, doctor, heard about what had happened. He was actually learning how to fly a beaver up here in Canada. And he heard the person teaching him, told him about the kid and he lands the plane, calls me and said, I heard about what this kid, what happened and I can fix him. And I'm like, buddy, you didn't hear what got cut off. You can't fix that. And he said, I'm the chief of surgery at Cedar sinai Medical Center. I can fix him. <laughs> I'm like, what? Wow. So I drive up there and he starts drawing on a piece of paper what he's gonna do, which is way too much information. I mean, if they find that at the airport, I'm going to jail. <laughs> and so, but there's something actually beautiful about that. I said, how much would that cost? He said, it would be staggering, but I'll do it for nothing. I'm like, I have nothing. And so, <laughs> so I flew back to Uganda and I uh, found the kid and I became his legal guardian. And we flew him over. We got off the airplane in London on the way back. And we're walking off the plane. He said, Father, could we just walk the rest of the way? I'm like, oh, buddy, no. <laughs> and I check my emails. And there, there's an email. This is when Obama was the president, uh, before we were creating all these problems for everybody. Like, and, and the email said this, we'd like to meet Charlie. Isn't that crazy? Mm. And it's legit. So we flew to Washington, D.C. And this kid that two days before was standing in the bush in, uh, on the border of Congo is now standing in the Oval Office. Right. And I just asked myself, like, why does God do that? And I think he wants to blow our minds. We think it's about status and power and all that. And Jesus says it's about kids. And mm -hmm. it's about a childlike faith for you and I, too. I love that. Okay, so we're going to continue the story in just a moment. We're going to find out what happened with Charlie and the surgery as well. You were challenged about Kabi, the witch doctor who was sentenced to death. God says to challenge, to love our enemies, but he surely doesn't mean someone who killed children. We'll continue that conversation in just a moment. 
We are back with Bob Goff, lawyer, author, and founder of a groundbreaking witch doctor school. We're going to get to that school in a moment, but Bob, I want to start with Kabi. He is the first witch doctor in the history of Uganda ever convicted for child sacrifice. You were part of bringing him to justice, but you couldn't get him out of your mind. God tells you to love your enemies. Yeah, Matthew 5, it says a lot of things to a lot of us, <laughs> including if you're on your way to church and realize somebody has something against you, put it down, go get squared up, and then come back. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about how do we just love our enemies? I'm like, Kabi. So I called the warden at the prison. I said, can I visit Kabi? And he says, like, nobody gets in here. I said, I'm the, actually the consul general for the Republic of Uganda. And he said, like, you're in. So, so we cool. came in, Kabi came in, and he took a knee, and he started talking about how bad he felt about what he'd done to Charlie. And then he started talking about his life and where witchcraft had entered it. And then his words, not mine, he said, I know I'm going to die in this place. You know what I need? I need forgiveness. And I felt like I was talking to a criminal hanging on a cross next to Jesus. You know the one that Jesus turned to and said, you get paradise. Mm -hmm. And actually something beautiful happened. Copy comes to Christ. And I'm like, no, like him. I wasn't trying to get him in. I was trying to keep him out. But there's simply <laughs> actually something that was Love actually started to change inside of me. I just realized that you don't need to understand grace to give a little grace. Mm -hmm. And so uh, actually, Kabi and I meet every time I go to Uganda. And he's been teaching me about what he's learning about faith. Because he doesn't believe the lie that some of us, some of the, your listeners are, are uh uh, believing. He doesn't believe he's the old version of him. He thinks he's a new creation. And you know what? He's right. He is. There's some consequences. He'll be separated from society for his life. But uh, the consequence is not that he's separated from Christ. And so I asked the warden, has anybody ever presented the gospel to all the guys on death row? And he said, nobody gets in here. I'm like, well, Copy lives here now. Could he do it? And it was like I did this Jedi thing because the warden said yes. So Kabi and I stood holding hands in the, in the courtyard of this maximum security prison. And Kabi presents the gospel of Jesus to 3,000 dying men. And you know what? He screwed it up. <laughs> oh, no. I've never heard anybody hack the gospel worse than Kabi. But you know what? There's something beautiful. The, the thing he got right was forgiveness. He got the part right about grace. And everybody in that prison knew this was Kabi who was talking. And the guy standing next to him is the guy that put him there. And there's something beautiful that happens. So all you these... get around that picture. You yes. can argue with Then them. he asks everybody if they want to get baptized. And hundreds of these prisoners are coming out. Kabi's like baptizing. I'm like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, maybe. <laughs> wow. And then Kabi grabs my hand and he said, Bob... I just want you to know that I forgive you. I'm like, you can't forgive me. You're the bad guy. Right, but, yeah, what do you but, have to forgive? Yeah, exactly. But you know, one of the things he's been reading is that he knows that he can't be perfect if I'm his enemy. And he actually is taking the gospel more seriously, I realized, than I was. And so we started a witch doctor school. Yeah, okay, so what is a witch doctor school? Yeah, it's a, we don't teach them how to be witch doctors. They already know. We teach them how to read and write. And the only books we have in witch doctor school to learn are the Bible and love does. This is your first book. <laughs> yeah, you read love their it. textbook. But there's something really actually beautiful in that. These uh, witch doctors are learning. They're starting to see themselves the way that Jesus sees them. When I, I, I'm just, I, again, I don't think we lead people to Jesus. I think Jesus leads people to Jesus. Mm. And I don't think people grow where they're informed. I think they grow where they're accepted. And so there's a place where they're actually accepted. And the crazy part is there's a ropes course up in the northern part of Uganda, probably 100 feet high. And I take all the witch doctors from witch doctor school up to the top. And when we get to the top, I unclip them. <laughs> Give them a little push. They're like, stop pushing me. I'm like, stop scaring people. <laughs> you stop scaring them, I'll stop pushing you. Well, you had a breakthrough recently with two of these witch doctors. They phoned you, Isn't that right? Crazy? And they said, there's a child sacrifice about to happen that yeah, we heard about. From Uganda, they call me in the middle of the night and they called to say a, a new witch doctors arrived. They took a kid into the bush. They're gonna sacrifice him. Do you think we ought to go get him? And I'm standing on the bed in my boxers. I'm like, get the kid. <laughs> 
And four hours later, I get a text message from these two bad guys that are actually starting to see themselves in a different light. And the text message says, we've rescued the child. He's with his mother. And the last two words of the text message, love does. Ugh. So starting to see people that creep us out differently, to see them, if we avoid all the people that Jesus was engaging, it'd be like reading every other page of the Bible and thinking you knew what it said. So just love creepy people knowing that you're among them <laughs> and that, that we're all just making our way towards Jesus. Okay, quick update on Charlie. We're almost out of time, but he had the surgery in Mount Sinai. He did. He was did. Successful. He's he's whole and uh, and uh, thriving, top of his class in school, and he's just moving forward with his life because there's people who see him not for all the difficulties he's faced in the back, past, but for what is coming ahead. I actually took him. Every one of my kids gets a ten-year-old adventure with dad, right? Mm -hmm. Charlie turns 10, and I said, buddy, where do you want to go? And he said, Kilimanjaro. I'm like, no, oh, no. don't you want to go to Disneyland? I mean, there's a reason the name Kill is in Manjaro. I and climbed Kilimanjaro, I know. It's a hike. It's brutal. <laughs> Nobody tells you how hard that is. Yeah, so me and the four-footer, we just started hiking. <laughs> And uh, you know what, they, he didn't quite make it to the top, but he got to about 14,500 feet, which isn't bad. Yeah. And, uh, and we had this ceremony. I brought all these medals with me and started putting them on his chest. I said, you're brave, you're courageous, you're a mountain climber. I didn't tell him how far he had to go. I said, look how far you've come. Mm. And I think that would be a great way for us to think about our faith with the people that have been creeping us out. Tell them how far they've come. Look at all the past. Don't have them over identify with what was behind. For Paul, who says we're new creations, have them like pressing towards to this hope that God has for him in the future. And, and even if they're witch doctors, them too. So good. <laughs> Stories like these are in your book, Everybody Always. Such a great book. I love what you said, all that you said about loving difficult people. It's a great challenge for all of us. Thank you so much for writing it and for challenging us to step outside our comfort zone and love the creepy people. Oh, uh, knowing we're among them. <laughs> yes, knowing we're among them. Thank you. We'll be right back. Bob Goff. See, I told you. You want him to be your grandfather too, don't you? <laughs> hey, let me just say this in closing. Jesus says at the end here of of what he is talking about, loving our enemies, He he says this thing and he says, he says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we've all heard, hopefully we've all heard, we, you can't be perfect. And we know that we can't be perfect. So, so what does Jesus mean by that? Well, that word perfect, it means to be complete. Be made whole. So that's what he wants. That's what he's saying. He says, this is what I want for you. This is what I want for you. And I, I read something the other day. I, I read this, and it made, made this make so much more sense. But John... John says this in 1 John 3. He says this. He says, Dear friends, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. This is what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. And I love that because it just reminds me that, that we're not there yet. We're not, we're not going to be there yet. But this is what he wants for us. And so again, we strive to be so. And it's not perfect. And it's not always going to be great. And it's not always going to be easy. But this is the way. I had to work again. This is the way. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning god we pray that that your word god just penetrates our heart and just all those thick outer crusty layers of our soul sometimes god that can just get so bent up god with trying to get back at people who may not like us or that maybe we don't like or uh, people that creep us out or people that injustice and, and harm ourselves or our family or others. God, it is difficult and uh, to be honest most of the time we don't want to but Father, you can help us. 
You tell us to be perfect as you are perfect. And we know that we can't do that on our own, so Father, help us. God, pour your spirit inside of us. God, lead us, inform us, grow us. Make us courageous enough and brave enough, God, to God to just to pray for those that have done evil against us or wrong against us or whatever it is, Father. And help us want to do good for them. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Will you stand to your feet as we sing and just respond through prayer and, and worship? We'll dismiss you in just a few moments. Well, hey, uh, get you guys out of here. Uh, but before you go, we just want to remind you that we have the night of worship tonight, uh, 5 Alive at 5 p.m. So we hope that you'll be back for that. Bring somebody with you if you want. Uh, it would be a lot of fun. You have a little more worship and a bit of a shorter message as well. And so it's just going to be a great time to get together. So that's at 5 o'clock tonight. Uh, but on your way out, you can give. We have our ushers in the back back there. If you choose to give, you can give that way. Uh, or you can go online to ridgegive.com and you can give online. But most importantly, just thank you guys for being here. Thank you for watching online. We're so glad that you're here. If you're here for the first time, we're so glad that you are here as well. So thank you. Hope you'll be back next week. Love you, church. We'll see you then. Y'all have a great week.
something just between you and me When I hear your voice I know I'm finally free Every single word is perfect as it can be Cause I need you here with me Open my mouth Give me a new song to sing Feel it right now With the praise offering Beautiful sound To you, Jesus the King Open my mouth Open my mouth A love that is new Following hard after you Open my heart Open my heart Whoa, you awake in the dawn In the depths of my soul Whoa, let the river of God Be the spring of my soul Should I? 